Hey there, listener, Corey Andrew Powell here, and I'm excited to share that Motivational Mondays is now sponsored by BetterHelp. Feeling stressed or anxious? Well, BetterHelp brings you online therapy that's convenient and affordable. NSLS members get 50% off your first month of BetterHelp when you sign up at betterhelp.com slash NSLS, or click the link in the show notes. Start your journey to better mental health today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another inspiring episode of Motivational Mondays. I'm Corey Andrew Powell, your host, and today I am so thrilled to have with me Kevin N. Wilkins, the founder, the visionary founder, I should say, and CEO of Trepwise. Now, he has over 35 years of experience and a track record of leading purpose-driven organizations to new heights. His insights into strategy, leadership, and community impact are invaluable. So we're going to dive into Kevin's journey and explore his transformative work and all the things he's doing to help shape and uh, build more, I would say, purpose-driven and thoughtful communities. Kevin, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Hey, Corey. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure, sir. And we're all about community. We're all about uh, service leadership and purpose-driven leadership. So this is a great conversation to have. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to mention to everyone, you you are sharing, you shared with me that you are uh, in New Orleans basically oh, yeah. right now, right? And yeah. you guys just had a storm. So we're glad you're okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, yes, absolutely. So let's dive right in. I would love to hear more about, if you could share with us, the ins- the the initial inspiration, if you will, behind finding your company, finding Trepwise, and how that experience has influenced your mission. Well, I appreciate you. I um, appreciate you asking me that. Yeah, Trepwise is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think I'll start back with my, my highlights of some of my career, because it kind of led me to Trepwise in many ways. Uh, I started my career in traditional packaged goods. So I worked for Procter & Gamble and did brand management for them back in the, oh, I'm aging here, late 80s, early 90s. Fantastic experience, learned a tremendous amount. Um, very much of a general management job. I then transitioned, uh, I went to business school and then I transitioned into financial services. Hmm. I was in financial services for like 20 years. And every time I would go back to some sort of business school reunion, people would be like, you're in financial services? Why are you in financial services? Uh, because it felt like I was more creative often. Mm-hmm. Was kind of, I was more of the marketing guy. Um, but I really liked financial services. I found it interesting. I found it dynamic. Um, no two days were the same. The, mar- the dynamic markets really keeps the job interesting. And I often joked I wasn't managing the money. They didn't let me near the money. They just I just managed the firms that manage the money or manage the <laughs> companies that manage the money. Right. Um, there was a mo- So I found myself on this like 20-year path that I worked really hard and I kept my head down and I get promoted and I got another title and maybe it made more money. And I was just on this path, you know, just keep your head down and keep going. And literally 20 years later, I was on this path. And I would argue that it met, really wasn't an intentional path. It was a path that I kind of fell into. Mm. That's, really, that's really meaningful. I was with an organization that we ended up selling to an organization in um, New York City. So a small financial services company was sold to a large financial services company. Mm. And I made a choice at that time not to go to New York. We were living in Boston and we'd been there for 20 years. And if we were to move, we would not move to New York City. We would probably move to New Orleans. And that's a bit of a foreshadowing. So I um, decided to stay in Boston, not go to the acquired firm. And um, began just focusing on nonprofits and startups and seeing if I could use my experience somehow to um, to uh, help the community or help organizations who want to help the community. Hmm. Uh, but I was a little bit wandering, not really on any kind of path, more curious and more exploring. Uh, my wife is a professional fundraiser, and she raises money in, um, in this uh, university setting. Hmm. So she had been working for Harvard for many years, and she got an opportunity to come to New Orleans to raise money for Tulane. And New Orleans is where she was from. Okay. I should, I should start my story with I married a woman from New Orleans. I was, was wondering about that connection. I when was. you marry a woman from New Orleans, you will ultimately end up in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> it just took us 28 years to get here, but we right. got here. And we decided to move the family in 2010. So 
that's a very relevant moment for me because my wife asked me, what do I want to do? And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I want to see if somehow my background could help the community in some way, shape or form. Um, New Orleans is not dripping in large industry. New Orleans is small hospitality, small businesses, um, lots of nonprofits, especially in the post Katrina world. A lot of people wanted to come to New Orleans to help, you know, save the city and help rebuild the city. Um, very different tapestry than the tapestry we lived in in Boston. So each um, have their unique attributes. Each have some uh, some limitations. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got here, I was it wasn't as if I was going to continue in financial services because that wasn't really a thing here. Um, and instead, and I wasn't. I mean, I had had that chapter as well. I I had done the financial services, and I had been very grateful for what I was able to accomplish there. And now it was time to do something different. And I asked myself for the first time in my life. What do I want to do? Mm, yeah. And that became a career with intention. And whereas I was on this path and I kept my head down and if I did well, I'd get promoted. And that path was very clear. Um, it was not my path. It was a path that was provided to me. Mm. And for the first time, 25 years into my career, it was time for me to begin laying out my path. So New Orleans was incredibly welcoming. And there was a lot of different organizations here, many of whom looked for support. The Katrina money in the nonprofit space was running out. The cameras had gone away, yet the city was still in a rebuilding mode mm. and still had a lot of challenges that it needed to overcome. And I remember one milestone moment was when I met with the Greater New Orleans Foundation, which is a fantastic organization. And they asked me to help them think through the sustainability of the nonprofits that they have been funding during Katrina because they wanted to make sure that they were sustainable mm. and very fair because money was drying up. So they had to make sure that the nonprofits were able to make the impact. My response was, you know what? I, I've been on boards of nonprofits, but I've never really worked for a nonprofit per se. It's not really big in my background. Um, I've, been, I've consulted with some, but you know, I don't have. I was not a. I was not a born and brought up nonprofit executive. I had this for-profit background, and the um, the person at the foundation said to me, "Exactly, we want the <laughs> we want the business discipline applied to a nonprofit sector," and that suddenly was interesting to me. And I go back to I wanted to somehow have my background help the community. And if the community that I really wanted to focus on was the purpose-driven community, there are so many great nonprofits in the world and there are so many great leaders of nonprofits. What can I do to maybe help them maximize their impact? Mm. I came with a lot of organizational effectiveness work. I came with a lot of strategic planning work um, or in my background. And I came, I came with a lot of like vision and mission-focused work. So what what a what an honor and what an opportunity to be able to begin working with the nonprofits in the greater New Orleans areas, with some foundations in the greater New Orleans areas to help them maximize what they want to do best, to help mm -hmm. them maximize their vision and their mission. So Trapwise was born in 2013. And we are we we were 10 years old. Now we've crossed over to our uh, 11th birthday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And our mission is to work with purpose-driven organizations to really maximize their potential. And we do so by aligning people, process, and vision of the organization. <clears throat> because the ultimate vision for us as a firm is thriving communities that are nourished with, with good ideas. And we believe that a thriving and equitable community nourished by good ideas can have ideas coming from anyone and anywhere. So if you can really focus on the nonprofits, the foundations, the organizations that want to do a really positive impact in the community, um, then you're going to have a thriving community. You're going to have an equitable community where people's ideas are heard from all different aspects of the community. And that is what we have built. That's wonderful. I love that. And also, there's so many layers there, because one of the big lessons that I took from what you just said is this idea of the journey we're on very often in life, it's sort of preparing us. We don't always realize it. It's preparing us and arming us with these tools that we may not necessarily realize that we may be applying later to a, yeah. whole, other, uh, a whole other situation or a career or um, 
life's mission, if you will. So I love the fact that you had this culmination of all the things you loved, and all of a sudden it led you to this other path where it was really your aha moment, as Oprah would say. <laughs> <laughs> not, to quote, not to quote the great queen, Oprah. And but I do love Oprah, so that's good. Yeah, <laughs> right? But isn't that what you say? That was your aha moment. You're like, oh my yes. gosh, everything I've been doing leads me to this. hundred percent. hundred yeah. percent. I love that. I often, and, um, I often get the question, if you were to change anything in your past, what would you change? And my answer is consistently nothing. Mm -hmm. Because we've, um, we are, to your point, we are a culmination of our life experiences. And all of my life experiences have ended me up today here talking to you. Yes. And yes. that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Excellent. And, you, you know, if you change anything in the past, that ev then everything could change going forward from that one change, right? Because mm -hmm. often people, uh, I do a lot of executive coaching of leaders, and um, often I often say to them that people's lives are like a mosaic. So when you step back, you see who you are, and if you begin removing different pebbles from the pe from the mosaic that you simply don't like, or you weren't proud of, or you weren't fond of or you just didn't want it to be part of your mosaic, you then step back again and the picture looks different, mm -hmm. right? So we are the culmination of our life experiences which have built this mosaic that each of us has that's unique and special and, and wonderful. Yeah. So uh, let's make sure that we can capitalize on that. Yeah, no, that's great advice. I often say the same thing. We share that sentiment because I, it, we all have those times in life where we say, oh, if I could have just X, Y, Z. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, that definitely is like the movie Back to the Future. I love that whole part yeah. of the film where if you just, if you manipulate one thing from the past, it can <laughs> greatly change, um, you know, the outcome. And you end up with like Biff as your father, apparently, in that movie, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is not... But we, want but we digress, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that because I can take it down that rabbit hole. We'll have a whole discussion about Back to the Future and all three sequ uh, the two sequels. But we'll stick uh, with you <laughs> for this interview. Um, you know, I I do want to know though, because you did tap into the the mosaic concept, which I love. One of the things that great leaders have is the ability to know that when they are experiencing what they think is a negative or a loss or a failure. It's actually there to help you learn from it. And I would imagine that is a part of what you do too and what you're bringing mm -hmm. forward when it comes to your work as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you it's like performance management. I often say that, first of all, all, all organizations need performance management because people who work for organizations need to know how they're doing. They need to feel invested into. They need to feel valued. And um, when I hear people talk, oh, I haven't had a performance review in 10 years, like I cringe hmm. uh, because like that, what, what does that say? What's the message? And then you hear, oh, add a boy or add a girl, you're doing great, you know, not terribly helpful, kind. <laughs> right, right. Not, not terribly helpful. Um, so I bring in the performance management framework to your question because you can learn so much about from the challenges that you might experience in your role. So, you know, we all show up to the role and we have our strengths and we have our areas of opportunity. And the goal is to maximize your strengths and address those opportunities such that they don't hold you back. Mm -hmm. So performance management allows you to really talk about those your strengths, which are very important and very real, and the challenges that they might be experiencing where they may need a little bit more help, they might need a little bit more support, they might need some professional development to help them deal with those challenges to make those challenges a strength. Mm -hmm. So I often talk to when I do executive coaching, it's the same thing. You know, and let's not, there is no shame. We have no shame and there is no guilt when you think about your, your life or your past. You know, you want to make sure that people are open and able to um, constructively talk about the things that have worked for them in their lives and some of the fail failures that they've had. Mm -hmm. Because you focus on the failures and what we've learned from them and then you can like course correct from that learning into making it into an area of uh, an area of strength. Yeah, yeah. That's such a timely comment too because this week's episode of Motivational Mondays is featuring a young woman named Alexa, uh, Alexa Curtis, and she's a former Disney radio host. Um, and her part of her platform as part of Gen Z is she's trying to teach them, her generation, more accountability and more uh, self awareness, which for her included this interesting thing where she would go to everyone in life professionally and sometimes personally who's rejected her. Any rejection she's gotten, she's she very constructively goes back to the person and says, 
would you mind telling me why you didn't give me that opportunity? Or would you mind telling me what did you think of me that made you choose another person for this situation? And, you know, when you do that, you have to also be willing to accept the responses and own it and take it into account. But I found that to be fascinating that she's not running from rejection. She's actually trying to empower herself with mm-hmm. knowing how people are using their judgment of her. Interesting. And learning, 100% interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was really great. So now you did mention the challenges though. So I want to ask you specifically when it comes to the work that you do, uh, being so much more aligned with purpose-driven organizations, uh, they do have their own unique set of challenges. So what are you? What would you say are some of the ones, like you just tapped into a couple, but what would you say are like kind of the main ones you run into and how do you address them? Oh man, um, there are, there are, Challenges that are unique to purpose-driven, but also can be applied to other organizations as well. Um, I often say culture is the single biggest predictor of the success of any organization. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that you have a really established culture that you feel is going to be appropriate for what you need to achieve a values-based culture or culture with a vision and a mission that's being, that's being like showcased that people can buy into Mm -hmm. oftentimes we work with leaders who are like, we want to fix this, which is great. Awesome that you want to fix this. Um, so jump in, let's jump in, let's roll up our sleeves and let's do like do, do, do. Right. Um, and let's get stuff done. Okay. I'm, I'm a big believer in getting stuff done hundred percent, but I'm also a big believer in clarity around the vision that you're trying to achieve. And I'm also a big believer in a, a mission statement that people can rally around that they can, they can buy into and they know how they're contributing to it. I'm a big believer in values. I remember when I was in business school um, and there was fi- several finance classes and they were all about the numbers. A lot of my friends were just all about the numbers and the numbers say everything. And the uh, the other stuff was like the soft, the people stuff. The people stuff is mm-hmm. kind of the stuff, right? Um, and I've learned in my career, it's actually the opposite. Like we're the consulting organization that starts with the org chart and the stakeholder engagement ecosystem versus the numbers. Numbers yes. are Numbers are important. I, I don't want to minimize them. You, I mean, we need to make sure the finances are working. However, we have to make sure that the bigger picture, the vision is really clear and your mission is articulated. And there's a value system that you can you can in, um, define the way you want your organization, the people within your organization to engage with each other and to work through to work through um, the uh, priorities that they have been set for themselves. Mm-hmm. I, when I coming from financial services, I had lots of life lessons, lots of life lessons. And I have worked in th- very different cultures because, you know, from organization to organization, they, by definition, they're going to have the right. unique structures. Right. I've had some, um, I've had worked in some cultures which were like, get it done, just get it done fast. And I don't care how many people you may like push away on, as you're getting it done, running, running down the field, you're tackling people, just get it done. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, okay, well, that's one way of thinking about it. The other way that I prefer is get it done, but make sure that people understand why you're doing what you're doing and make sure you get the buy-in from the key stakeholders and, and make sure you're being really strong with your communications so people understand like why things are happening the way they are. Be collaborative, you know, care about the people you work with because we all work so hard. Just a different mindset. The same get it done culture, get it done, but very different in terms of how to get it done. Mm-hmm. And I think some organizations in the purpose-driven space get so focused on the purpose, they they forget perhaps about the other, the other um, elements that can help drive a successful organization. Right. Spending time on vision and mission takes time. Making sure your values are right, that takes time. Living your values, that's that's a mindset that you need to embrace. And all of that can be viewed as, I don't have time for that. I, I need to get the work done. When in fact, the when what we are able to do is when we work with organizations, we showcase how important it is mm-hmm. to get vision, mission, values in place, to make sure your, so your stakeholders are clear, to make sure the communication systems are clear, to make sure that you've got a goal setting process and a performance management process to show that you are doing well because it's all about impact. And as foundations are thinking about where they put their money, as donors are thinking about where they put their money, um, as Mackenzie Scott, who's done so much amazing things in this country with her donations to nonprofits, she's asking herself, where do I put the money? Hmm. Put the money where there's impact. 
Yeah. yeah. How do you demonstrate impact? You need to measure it. You need clarity around it. You need to make sure that everyone's aligned with why you're doing what you're doing. And you want to make sure that you have a team of people who are totally empowered. And I think if organizations can really focus on that, getting the, the right people in the right chairs, doing the right jobs, making sure the culture is really, really clear, making sure the values are clear, the vision and mission is super clear, the strategic priorities, exactly what you need to do to make the impact you want to make, and how are we measuring against it? Mm. We do a lot of strategic planning work. And I often call the strategic plan a fundable asset. You want to make sure that at the end of the strategic planning process, you have a plan that you can show to any stakeholder, any donor out there, any foundation out there, right. say, here is our plan. And we believe it is a fundable plan because of the impact we're going to achieve. And mm -hmm. if these organizations can get that fundable plan, that's the huge win. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely see how you can, how you said that can really work across all industries really as a sort of like a, a foundational idea, but I definitely see where it makes more sense in a mission purpose-driven organization because a lot of the end game is an emotive response. It's not just about like a monetary bottom line, but okay, great, this company made X amount of profits. You're, for you guys, like profit is also part of like, what was the impact on the community that we just delivered? And um, so I, I see that distinction right. there, right? You have to have people who buy into that same dream and that mission and that purpose or else it's not going to work, basically. Totally, totally, mm -hmm. yes. Wow, yeah, yeah. So when it comes to one project, you'd say, one maybe big organization that did something great, do you have one standout for you that was like this one project where like, yeah, we really made a difference on that one? Oh, man. <laughs> that is a um, fantastic question. And I can humbly say that like, our work does make a difference. And it's, um, or, or I wouldn't do it. Like, if we're not going to make a difference, that, that it's not, you're not here for the money. You're not here for the right. trappings. You're here to make a difference, right? So you hope that, um, that whomever you're working with, whether they're small or whether they're large, that you are making a difference. I mentioned that we do a lot of strategic planning work, and I often say that strategic planning is for organizations. So how can we make an organization as effective as possible to allow them to achieve their vision and mission and allow them to make sure that they get the, um, the, they get the end results that they're looking for? We also do systems work. So I, often, I say that you know when we work with organizations, we bring people from that organization and stakeholders that are serviced by those organizations and board members that are part of it, and we bring them around a table to engage them in a process to help build a plan for that organization. And we are very effective at having being like complex conversations. At the same time, we also talk. We also focus on systems. How do how do we make sure that the mental health of college students is as supported as possible? How do we ensure that children that have had traumatic experiences can heal and we can prevent them from going forward? Mm -hmm. That requires bringing organizations around the table and making sure organizations are working in tandem together for that common system output. So whether it's like, how do we make sure no one goes hungry during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that there's affordable housing for for the vast majority of the population? How do we create pathways for opportunity youth to really allow themselves to get, a, get ahead and get advanced into their lives and that they, they have the same opportunities as other people? Um, really, really super important. So, but those are complex questions and those are complex issues, right? So to answer your question, <laughs> one of the, the piece of work that I am most satisfied with is really thinking about the mental health and trauma that children have had in the state of Louisiana. Mm. This plan called Whole Health Louisiana. And the purpose of the plan was to ensure that all children who've experienced some level of trauma in their life can get the care that they need to be able to heal. And what can we do as a system to prevent the trauma from happening? So it was an 18 month ex um, experience. Involved planning process. The um, the plan has been published out, and right now we're in the implementation stage. Um, it was sponsored by the first lady and uh, the Department of Health um, of, the, of the state of Louisiana. So uh, it had a lot of visibility. It had a lot of support, um, but it's hard work. 
I mean, solving trauma in the state of Louisiana, mm-hmm. where we are maybe the 48th or 49th in the, in the country, um, we can do better. Right. And so we needed to have that rallying cry. We can do better. It wasn't as if people didn't care. It wasn't as if we didn't have organizations in place who were desperately trying to help the situation. Mm-hmm. It's, we needed to coordinate need to make sure vision for trauma, we need to understand the system and what elements of the system were wrong and that causing trauma versus preventing it. And how do we fix those elements? And how do we work together in order to achieve these greater outcomes? Because when you've got organizations working together in tandem, the, the system can become so much stronger and so mm-hmm. much better. Mm-hmm. So that's the work that I'm, um, that I'm most proud of. Well, first I will say Thank you for that, because mental health, especially in children, is so monumentally important because, as you alluded to there, if you don't take care of it, then you're creating really damaged adults. And then it's sort of out of control and it can manifest in other ways. And now you have an adult with unresolved trauma that now is trying to navigate through life. And um, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah, that's a big deal. Um, so that's that's wonderful work. And I can see how that can be really rewarding because that's like l- really life saving stuff from the mental health perspective. So well done, sir. Excellent. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It was a huge team effort, huge team effort. Mm-hmm. Well, to get those organizations, to get the organizations in a room and to have them commit to this, that's that's praise for everyone, praise for every one of those organizations, praise for all the leaders of those organizations, praise for the government and the private sector. I mean, they're really, people rallied around this. It's important. Hard work, hard work, but mm-hmm. hard work is good work, you know? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, you talked a bit, a little about the idea of when it comes to a purpose-driven organization being kind of getting like the buy-in from everyone who's involved to sort of have everyone on the same page and I don't know, believing in the vision. So when mm-hmm. it comes to that, that comes to the area of what you'd call, I guess, shared leadership, which you spoke a little bit about as well. Yeah, so do. yeah. What is the correlation there between like successful and uh, a successful purpose-driven organization and fostering a community of shared leadership and inclusivity yeah. Where, you know, and which has sort of become like it, strangely, I don't know, and in, in today's political climate, that word has become like this bad word. And I'm like, why is it so, but such a bad word just to say, hey, everyone should have a seat at the table. But in any event. Yes, uh, everyone should have a seat at the table. All right. voices. We're, we're very much of a human centered firm. And we start with the people, you know, all, all the people that are impacted by any organization. Um, shared leadership. It is. Uh, a newer concept, um, although it's been it's been reflected in some older concepts in the United States around shared leadership, like the jury for any kind of trial is a shared leadership model where you've got mm-hmm. twelve people in the room coming up with the coming up with a conclusion, all independently coming together. Um, but right now in this day and age, we're seeing nonprofit organizations, and we're supporting this move from an individual leader model to a shared leader model. Um, because it is inclusive, where you have, instead of one person at the top calling all the shots, maybe being a little disempowering because, you know, they even, they have the vision and try to keep up with them. Not suggesting that's always bad by any means. That can mm-hmm. be very effective depending on the leader. However, um, what we're seeing and what we support is this other concept called share leadership where you might have co-leaders at the top or three leaders at the top of the organization, all having some sort of functional leadership role, all working together in a collaborative fashion to achieve the outcomes that they're looking to achieve, all leveraging maybe two or three minds versus just one mind to really lead the organization. And what we've seen is when you have an organization that's run by a team up on top, um, members of the team within the organization feel much more engaged, feel much more empowered. There's a lot more transparency and there's more inclusivity by definition because you've got more people at the top who are trying to make the right decisions for these organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big believer in this model. There's lots of different benefits to it. We have, um, we just launched a toolkit to help a nonprofit and purpose-driven organizations to think through how do we begin to embrace a shared leadership model. Whether we're ready for it, 
of what we need to have in place to be ready for? Do we have a plan that will allow us to migrate or transition to a, le a shared leadership model? And then finally, how do we hire? How do we? How does it impact the culture? Do we need to rethink of our vision, and our values? So it, it touches everything that we've been talking about. It's not as if today you wake up with one leader and tomorrow you wake up with three. It takes right. more than that to get there. right. Um, but you need to make sure that you're understanding like the implications on the organization of going this way. But what we're seeing is organizations that have shared leadership in their approach, um, where they bring board members in and they have the board be also kind of a shared leadership concept where you bring in the stakeholders that you're servicing as a nonprofit and make sure that their voices are on the board. Mm -hmm. And make sure you're creating more diversity in terms of whose voices you're, you're listening to when it comes to this topic area. So you can have shared leadership in the board structure. You can have shared leadership in the organizational structure. The whole idea is how do we bring in diverse voices to allow for the best ideas to accumulate and be surfaced and be implemented? Mm, yeah, that's a great lesson. I've always thought that America as um, well, maybe even humanity, but I mean, America distinctly speaking about as a country would be so much farther ahead in many areas of industry had we had a, a level playing field for everyone for all yeah. the decades that we haven't, right? Or centuries for that matter that we haven't. I just think we would be so much farther ahead because of all the things that we did not exchange amongst ourselves that were perhaps cultural or ethnic or things that were just isolated to one particular group that another group would have really benefited from knowing. And I just think at the end of the day, we were the ones as Americans who have lost out by not having done that sort of structure in our society so that's, that's interesting that's an interesting mm -hmm. observation yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh wait i'm sorry one second i think we had a little technical glitch there in what you were saying would you repeat that sure i um i agree exactly with what you're saying corey i think the more voices that you have around the table, the more relevant voices and the diverse perspectives, the better outcomes you're going to achieve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, I think so. So hopefully going forward, world and America, let's all you know, talk to each other and learn from each other a little bit more than we've done in the past. So um, gosh, as we are getting close to our time here, I have one more question for you, which okay. is, I would love to know if you were able to uh, advise someone on how they might start to, uh, I guess, look to work in a field like you've done to enter the world of working as a purpose-driven professional in the purpose-driven sector. Uh, what advice would you give them for how they could start their career? It's a great question. What are you most passionate about? What, what gets you excited? You know, what, what, what's gonna motivate you to get out of bed every morning and go do something? Because working in the purpose-driven space is hard work, you know, working in the nonprofit space, it's hard work. Uh, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. You need to have clarity around what you're doing. Um, you need to learn about like, what can, what is, how best can I address this problem? Maybe it's not working for that nonprofit organization. Maybe it's working for a for-profit or organization that has a corporate social responsibility element to their culture, and they want you to kind of work in that setting that could help fund organizations that work on the issue that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of ways of tackling it, but ask the question, like, am I choosing to do what I'm doing every day? And the minute you forget about that choice, the minute you find yourself in year 12 on a path that you maybe didn't necessarily choose every step of the way, um, that can be a problem. So ask yourself every day, am I choosing what I'm doing? And am I passionate about it? Mm -hmm. And I think if you can have those two guardrails, am I making the choice and am I, am I following my passion, then you're gonna be ending up, I think, in a good space. Excellent advice, wonderful words of wisdom from Mr. Kevin Wilkins, the visionary founder and CEO of Trepwise. And it's been a great conversation with you. I mean, you are so aligned with the NSLS, with all your, uh, your, your, I guess your your purpose driven work as a community builder. And we really, really admire that here. So thank you for being here with me today on Motivational Mondays. I really appreciate it, Corey. I would love to come back and see you again sometime. Thank you.